Hello there. In today's video, we are going to be looking all about capacitors. Uh, so by the end of today, you're going to understand how capacitors work with some key equations for them. So you're going to be able to understand the structure and function of a capacitor, uh, and you're also going to be able to use some key, ex a key, some key equations to explain their behaviour. And we might start looking a little bit at exponential decay. Now, this isn't something that is needed um, for CIE, um, but it is something that is kind of useful to understand um, when it comes to looking at the more generalised behaviour. Okay, so what are capacitors? Um, really simply, um, they are a device that can store electrical charge. And I'll talk about how they work in a minute. Um, but we need to know a couple of their uses. Um, so some of their uses um, I'm just going to talk about now. Other ones will become clearer when we go on to the electronics uh, module later on in the year. Um, but the main use, or the key use, is that they store charge, um, or they store energy. Now, that's quite unusual, because up until now we've dealt with classical circuits, or DC circuits, that don't have the ability to store any charge. So uh, current either leaves a battery or power supply and nowhere else. We're going to add in uh, these capacitors, which will give us a couple of extra... Uh, uses of that or extra sources of charge. Uh, the second thing that they can be used for is uh, to smooth ripples. And when we go on to look at uh, AC, so I'll put AC ripples, when we look at AC current, um, I'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, the other thing they can be used is to block DC. Again, I'll explain how they can block DC when we go on to the electronics unit. Okay, so what does a capacitor actually look like? Um, very simply put, it is two plates of metal, uh, and those plates can be attached to a voltage or to a power supply. Just like this, that's them connected to a battery. Um, now, these plates in practice can be very long, and what we can then do, if here's plate 1 uh, and here's plate 2, I'll make that a different colour just so it's easier to see, here's plate 2, um, what they tend to do in a real capacitor is they roll those plates up against each other like that um, to kind of make a plate sandwich, but you can still treat them as two parallel plates in front of each other, they just roll them around um, with a bit of an insulator uh, in the middle in between the two plates, uh, so obviously that they don't touch. Now if you think about what we know so far, this is going to create an electric field between these two plates. How does that happen? Well, when I first switch on my power supply, if you remember, always the uh, long end of a battery symbol is a positive end, the short end is a negative end. So conventional current um, is going to go from positive to negative, while the actual electrons will go from negative to positive. So this is where it gets a little bit complicated sometimes when we're dealing with capacitors. Um, if you're thinking about the, <coughs> about the directions that the electrons travel, they always go from negative to positive. If you're thinking about the way that the uh, current goes, current we define as going from positive to negative. So it can be a little bit confusing. But anyway, what will happen is, if this is connected to the negative end, then I will get a build-up of electrons on one side. And those electrons will have come from the other plate, so it will leave behind positive charge on the other plate. Now, if you think about balancing things out, whatever the charge is on this plate, that must be equal to the charge on the other plate. So I have equal charge on both, um, and I just summarise that as I say that the whole plate is charged with charge Q, sorry, the whole capacitor is charged with is charged at charge Q. Um, now, as I build up an imbalance of charge, I'm going to start to create a voltage between these two plates. Now, let's just think about how that will work in practice. So I just want you to imagine that I put in an ammeter here. So let's just add in... Oops. 
an ammeter to this part of the circuit. So what can we say about the current in this circuit as I charge it up? Well, let's just put in a graph like this. Here's my current, here's my time. When I first connect this to the power supply, there's going to be no imbalance in charge, so I'm going to get a very large current. So it's going to be up here somewhere on my graph. Current will flow very rapidly. However, over time, I start to build up some negative charge here, and I start to build up positive charge here. Now, I'm trying to force electrons onto this plate, but because it's already negative, this, I start to get a force of repulsion against my electrons on this plate. So what will happen is, over time, my current will reduce and trail off to zero. This should be more of a curve. Um, I could talk about that in terms of EMF. I can say that the EMF of the battery minus the EMF of the plates or the capacitor, let's call it C for capacitor, is equal to the total EMF. And when you think about the equation written that way, well, the EMF of the battery is always going to be constant, but the EMF of the capacitors will increase. So I'm removing more numbers each time from it. So what happens is the EMF effective on these that's driving this current around the circuit reduces over time to zero. So my current eventually, if my EMF dro drops to zero, my current will drop to zero. So I get this classic decay curve. Um, now, the logic of these curves is not required for CIE. Um, and there is a, a really nice equation that most of the other examples do teach, but you don't need it for Cambridge. However, you may well be asked to measure uh, current at different times in a discharging or charging capacitor in the practical exam. Now, I will give you some practice of that um, during our lessons, um, but just be aware that if you see these things decaying, and you might see something like uh, I is equal to I naught E to the negative T over RC. That's actually the equation. Um, for the discharge of a capacitor. If you see equations like that, don't panic. You're not supposed to know this um, for CIE, but it might be on your exam. Um, so we'll probably talk about it a little bit um, in our lessons. Okay, so we always need some equations, and the key one to know here is the idea of capacitance. So capa the capacitance of a capacitor is the amount of charge that the capacitor requires per volt of potential difference applied. Its units are coulombs per volt, um, and we give that the derived unit of the farad. So go ahead and see if you can work out what the equation will be. So you should have, now we give capacitance the symbol C, which is confusing because as you know, C is also the unit of the coulomb. This is very difficult. C is capacitor, I'll just join it to there. C is capacitance. Q is charge and V is voltage. So this is where you do have to be really careful. So the units of that are the farad for C, the coulomb for Q and the volt for V. So be really, really careful with what we're dealing with here. Um, now it turns out that uh, most capacitors store very, very little charge uh, for voltage. So generally, uh, F is in the range of micro to milli. So you should be getting, when you calculate most uh, capacitances, you should be getting something between 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9. Um, you minus 9, 10 to the minus 3. You might get, you might get nano farads as well, they're quite common. Um, if you get something in the tens of farads, that's possible but unlikely. And if you get something in the thousands, unless it's talking about a supercapacitor or some kind of novel uh, application, chances are you may have gone wrong. So expect small numbers for capacitance. Okay, so let's turn now to think about the energy that is stored in a capacitor. Um, I've said already that the, the, the uh, capacitance of a capacitor 
is charge divided by voltage, which as you can see, simplifies to this form. So this gives me the voltage on a capacitor. I can say the voltage is equal to the uh, charge divided by the capacitance. Now what you might remember is this idea that voltage is equal to work done per coulomb of charge. So that simplifies to this form. However, that is only true if we assume that V is constant. In reality, I can say that work done is equal to the integral of Q with respect to voltage. There are other forms I could put it in as well, but that's going to be, I'm just going to simplify it to this. Now we've gone over this a couple of times now, so hopefully you're comfortable with the idea that the integral of something just means the area under its curve. Now I've said over here that V is equal to Q divided by C. So if I was to plot V as a graph, I would expect a straight line graph through the origin with a gradient of 1 over the capacitor, capacitance, sorry. Um, clearly, therefore, the work done here, which is the area, I can say the work done is equal to a half C, uh, sorry, a half V Q, because it's just the area of a triangle. Base is Q, height is V. And if I substitute in from my previous equation, I get two forms. Using the fact that Q is CV and V is Q over C, I can then say that the work done is a half CV squared, and it is also a half Q squared over C. And those are all different methods that I could use to find the work done or the energy stored in a capacitor. Now you can always work this out from first principles, but I think it's generally easier if you just learn these equations. They are quite important um, and they do make life a little bit easier for you. Okay, so just like uh, resistors, we can put capacitors in series and parallel. Um, and just like resistors, you need to know the equations for how they work when that happens. So let's think here about two uh, capacitors, and I'm going to call them C1 and C2. Now, I'm going to connect them up to a voltage like this. So what kind of things do we know about this? Well, the first thing I can say is that the voltage across them both will be the same. If I call this V1 and this V2, I can say V1 is equal to V2, and that is just equal to the voltage across the pair of capacitors in, in parallel. Um, that should be fairly clear to you from Kirchhoff's uh, second law, where we say that the sum of the EMF around a closed loop uh, is equal to the sum of the voltages. So if we think around this is a closed loop, um, I have no EMF, so I can say whatever I gain through this one, I must lose through this one. So around a loop like that, um, they must both have the same voltage. Um, what else can I say? Well, let's just think about uh, the charge on these two. So I'm going to have a charge of Q1 on the first, and I'm going to have a charge of Q2 on the second. So what can I say about the total charge? Well, think about the individual electrons. Electrons will flow in on one side, and they'll flow out on the other. So what I can say is that the total charge, which I'm just going to call Q, is equal to the charge on the first plus the charge on the second. Now, if we think back to our key equations, we know that Q is equal to uh, C times V, you know, capacitance times voltage. So that enables me to say that Q total is equal to CV1 plus CV2. Um, and I can also rewrite this big Q 
as the total capacitance times the total voltage, voltage across them both. So that's equal to CV1 plus CV2. But up here, I said that the voltage on both of them is the same. So I can say CV is equal to, just make these 1 and 2, uh, C1 V, sorry, C1 times just V, because it's the same V, plus C2 times V. Notice I've got a common factor here, so I can just take that out, and I can say that the total capacitance of the two is equal to the sum of their individual capacitances. So this is the uh, slightly different way to resistors. And if I have resistors in parallel, I'd say 1 over RT is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, blah, blah, blah. For capacitors, I just add the capacitances when they are in sorry when they are in parallel. Okay, so this is the key result. You may be asked to prove that in the exam, so be confident that you can replicate this working. If I think of them in series, I can go through a similar exercise. So I'm going to apply a voltage, which I'm just going to call capital V for voltage by itself to them. And then I'm going to have V1 and V2 across capacitor C1 and C2. Now again, go back to Kirchhoff's second law. Here I have a, com a complete loop that goes like this. Um, so what I can say is that the total voltage is equal to the voltage through the first plus the voltage in the second. The voltage in the two capacitors is no longer the same. Um, it's the voltage is split. This is acting a little bit like a potential divider. Now the other thing I can think about is what's actually going to happen to the charge. So let's assume that electrons are going that way. Um, then what I can say is that an electron will leave here and move to here. Yeah. Electrons will go from over here and travel to this plate. Now, if you think about it, when this capacitor eventually reaches equilibrium, whatever the charge is on this plate has got to be equal to the charge on the other plate. Um, because if it wasn't, I'd have an imbalance in charge and electrons would flow back the other way. So what I can say is that Q1 is equal to Q2. So I'm just going to call the charge on them just a capital Q. It's something that we do a lot. Um, if we do no subscript, it just means the total or the overall. So what can I do with that? Well, let's think about our equation for capacitance. I know that the capacitance of capacitor 1 is equal to the voltage on capacitor 1 divided by its charge. Um, so if I was to rearrange it, I can say that Q is equal to C1 V1. Um, but that same Q is also going to be the same for uh, capacitor 2. So it would be the capacitance of capacitor 2 multiplied by the voltage of, capacitance two, of capacitor 2, but it will be the same Q. These are the same. Um, just to write them again here, I can say, re just rearrange these two equations. V2 is Q over C2. So what can I do with this now? Well, I know that the overall voltage, the voltage across both of them, oops, is equal to the charge, which remember is the same on both of them, divided by their total capacitance. Um, now I know that the voltage here using this equation is equal to V1 plus V2. Here's V1, here's V2. So I can say that this voltage is equal to Q over C1 plus Q over C2. And because all of these Qs are the same, that's a common factor, so I can take them out, and I get 1 over the total capacitance is equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And that is my key result. So you can see now this is very similar to resistors, but it's just inverted. 
Whereas resistors in series, you add the resistances, and when they're in parallel, you do the one over equation. It's the opposite with capacitors. When capacitors are in parallel, we add the capacitance. When capacitors are in series, we use the one over equation. OK, so there's one last thing that we need to talk about, and that is capacitance in a field. So this is something that comes up a little, uh, fairly often on the exam, so it's a good idea just to be familiar with it. And it's pretty simple. So let's imagine I've got a Van de Graaff generator here, and it is charged up to voltage V. What can I say is happening? Well, if you remember, this is going to act kind of like a point charge. Now, though when I have a point charge, this gives me a radial field. So, with a radial field, I always know that the potential at the field is equal to Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. You can look back on the last video if you're unsure about how we got there. If you also think, I've just got this standard result, capacitance is charge divided by voltage. So it's pretty obvious then that I can say the capacitance of my Van de Graaff generator is 4 pi epsilon naught R. And again, standard result worth knowing, and you are going to need to be able to derive it, which I'm going to show you how to do now. So we're just going to do a couple of worked examples now to make sure you really understand it. Um, so here's a part exam question, and it's talking about a solid metal sphere, radius R, insulated from its surroundings. In other words, we're talking about a Van de Graaff generator here. Um, so the charge on the surface of the sphere, but may be considered to be point charges in its centre. This is going to be important later. So I'm just going to say it's acting like charge Q here, therefore we have a radial field. So we're first asked to define capacitance. So what we need is just a simple restatement of the equation. So capacitance is the ratio of charge to voltage. We don't want to say across plates because, as we can see here, um, I don't necessarily have to have two parallel plates. In a capacitor, I have plates, um, but I can have capacitance on an isolated object as well. It's then asked to show that the capacitance C of the sphere is given by the expression uh, C is 4 pi epsilon naught R. So this is pretty simple. I just start with my standard result of capacitance as Q over V. That's just a restatement of this bit, uh, just written in two words. And I know that V in a radial field is Q over 4 pi epsilon naught R. Um, so then I can just substitute into this. So if I multiply by 4 pi epsilon naught R, then I get V lots of 4 pi epsilon naught R is equal to Q. And then I can say Q over V, therefore, so divide both sides by V, Q over V is 4 pi epsilon naught R, which is C. So there's my standard result. Uh, I'm then given a sphere of radius 36 centimetres, so determine for the sphere its capacitance. Always worth it, any question like this, just rewrite it um, in, uh, without the SI prefixes. You can obviously convert and say that is 0 0.36, um, but I don't like to do that because I think it's a good way of making a little mistake sometimes, especially under exam pressure, um, so it's best, I think, just to leave it like that. So I would then plug that back into the equation that I had earlier. Uh, epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12. You will get that on the exam. Times 36 times 10 to the negative 2, which comes out at 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11 farads. Um, and remember I said that capacitance is usually very small, really something that isn't specifically designed to be a capacitor, so that seems fine to me as a result. Then you're asked to find the charge required to raise the potential of the sphere from 0 to 7.0 times 10 to the 5. So again, pretty simple. I just need to know this standard equation. Q is equal to C times V. C is 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11. And I'm just going to multiply that by 7 times 10 to the 5, which is the voltage I need. Uh, so that comes out as 2.8 times 10 to the negative 5. Coulombs. 
And then you're asked to suggest why your calculations in B for a metal sphere would not apply to a plastic sphere. Now, it's tempting to say that you can't charge a plastic sphere, but we know we can, because if I rub a plastic ruler, it will get a static charge. So why can't I do it this way, then? Well, it does come down to the fact that it is an insulator, um, but not necessarily in the way that you might think. Because it's an insulator, what happens is charges can't balance out. Q's or the charge is fixed. So what happens is, is if I remove some charge from one part of the sphere, that charge remains lost from this area, but it doesn't balance out. So that has two consequences. Firstly, um, Q is not at the centre. I can only say that charges act as though they're all in the, gathered in the centre when they're distributed evenly around the outside of a sphere. If they're no longer distributed evenly, then you think if I have lots of Q over here, then the charges are actually acting as though they're over in this position, not in the centre. Um, the other problem um, is that there is no single potential. Because the same way that I have different concentrations of charges, here I could have a high voltage, over here I could have V is zero. So that's from different places. So again, using uh, C is equal to QV doesn't make any sense because which V am I going to use? Which part? Um, so those are the reasons for that one. You're then told a spark uh, connects, suddenly connects the metal sphere to B to Earth, uh, and you are asked to calculate the energy dissipated in the spark. Well, for this one, we're going to go back again to the equation that we got R earlier. Um, I want something with... I, have, I worked out the capacitance earlier, and I've got a change in voltage, so it'll be CV. Now, I'm going from one voltage to another voltage. So if you think about this in terms of work done, I need to find a change in energy. So what I'm going to say is that is a half lot of the capacitance, which is still 4 times 10 to negative 11. Um, and then I need to do it multiplied by 7.0 times 10 to the 5 squared, and then take away 2.5 times 10 to the 5 squared. Don't take the two numbers away and then square them, because I need to find the potential here and then subtract the sorry the work done to get to here, and then subtract the work done to get to here. So just be aware of that. But when you do it correctly, you get 2.8 times 10 to the negative 5 uh, joules. Okay, so uh, say two functions of capacitors and electrical circuits. Um, you can just pick any from the start, so smoothing DC ripples, uh, blocking, D blocking DC, anything like that. i have given three capacitors, each mark 30 farads, 6 volts are shown. So I have two in parallel here, so I can say C total is C1 plus C2. Remember, don't get confused, as I did in an earlier take with the resistor equation, you need to add them. So that'll be 30 microfarads plus 30 microfarads, so that'll be 60 microfarads. Now I need to add in the one for this one. So this is now in series. So I can say 1 over C is 1 over 60 microfarads plus 1 over 30 microfarads. And if you plug that into a calculator, you get that C is equal to 20 microfarads. Um, you could use times 10 to negative uh, 6 in there for your micros, but because you're just adding numbers together, you don't actually have to. You can just remember to leave the units in microfarads. If you're not confident with that, by all means, stick in the times 10 to negative 6. It'll work just as well. This last bit, part 2, is a little bit tricky. Um, so it's worth just thinking kind of carefully about it because there, there are some, um, some pretty mean uh, bits of equations to work out here. So let's just start with the idea that charge is C over V. Um, what can I say? Well, um, I know that uh, the charge on here, whatever Q goes to there, because this is leaving the place, let's again imagine that electrons are going that way. 
doesn't really matter which way we're going. But let's say electrons are going that way. Some of the electrons are going to go that way. And some of the electrons are going to go that way. Um, so what that tells me is that the oops, is that the charge on uh, capacitor one is equal to the charge on capacitor two plus the charge on capacitor three. If I call this C two, C three, C one. Um, now putting that into an equation, putting this back into this equation, um, I can say therefore that uh, capacitor, the capacitance of capacitor one divided by uh, Q1 is equal to capacitance 2 divided by Q2 plus capacitance 3 divided by Q3. Now, they are all marked the same, so they all have the same capacitance. So I actually can get rid of these subscripts and say that's a common factor, which means I can divide through by it, and I can say 1 over Q1 is equal to 1 over Q2, sorry, these should be Vs, shouldn't they? Talking a load of rubbish. So I can say C over V1 is equal to C over V2 plus C over V3. There we go. Now these Cs cancel because they are the same capacitance. So I get 1 over V1 is equal to 1 over V2 plus 1 over V3. Now, what I can also say is because these are around, these are in parallel with each other and are the only things in their loop, I can say V2 is equal to V3. So I can say 1 over V1 is equal to 2 over V1 and 2. So if I simplify that, or just flip, the flip that over, I can say V1 is equal to V1 and 2, 1 or 2, divided by 2. Now, what's that actually telling me? It's telling me that whatever voltage I put across here, that is going to equal a half the voltage there. So it will always be halved. So if this 6 volts, this is the maximum safe voltage and all capacitors um, are marked like this. So I can say that neither V1 nor V2 or V3, let's just correct that a little bit, uh, can ever be more than 6. If it goes above 6 I kill the capacitor. So if I make V1 as 6 volts, which is the maximum V1 can take, V2 and V3 will both be equal to 3 volts. Now if I think about uh, how this works the potential divider, the potential will be shared across them. So if I supply 9 volts, which is the sum of these two, then what I've just worked out is that 6 volts will go to V1, which is fine, and 3 volts will go to V2 and V3, which is also fine. You may have some questions about that, so if you do, please do let me know in the lesson. Um, but otherwise, I look forward to seeing you later.